Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 120, the season four premiere, and we welcome the one, the only, Ross Levine with Warrior Cup right around the corner. He was the only guy that was the right guy to have on the show. The all-time leader in Warrior Cups. He's got nine of them things. We're going to be previewing the event. Of course, we're going to talk karate combat because he is the reigning defending karate combat middleweight champion of the world. But Ross, before I brag about you too much, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I don't know how much more I could do there. Um, Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, It's always a pleasure being here. Episode 120, that's a huge accomplishment in itself. Uh, Season four, I'm pumped to be part of that. And uh, yeah, man, let's let's get to business. Let's talk about Warrior Cups, karate combat, my sport karate career, turbo sports performance. We got a lot to catch up on, man. (laughs) I know it's been too long. We last had you all the way back in episode 12 before we ever even had like video on the podcast. It was just me like on my phone recording it in a dorm at Stanford. And uh, and now here we are on Black Belt Magazine. Uh, A couple of things for our consistent audience for season four that are going to be different. Number one is that not only are we streaming on Black Belt Magazine, but also the Jackson Rudolph podcast Facebook page which has been pretty much dormant other than announcing new guests. It is also going to host the stream as well. So be sure to go and support that both locations, join the conversation, jump in those comment sections. Um, And then the other thing is that as I go into the clinical phase of medical school, um, I'm not going to be able to hit like the consistent, like every Thursday of whatever month or whatever with the podcast. So it's going to be less consistent but my goal is to go for like more consistent, high quality guests. So like pretty much every time you guys hear about a podcast coming up, it's going to be a pretty big name such as uh, Ross Levine right here. Um, so anyway, much. Ross, with, uh, with Warrior Cup coming up so close, <laughs> and for those of the, the Black Belt Magazine audience that maybe haven't followed sport karate as much and don't know some of the history, or just for some of the kids in sport karate that unfortunately don't know the history. Mm. I want to start by just having you reflect on your nine warrior cups. You don't have to go through all of them because that's what you know, right? Uh, but just some of the, the highlights, the best memories from those experiences. Man, um, so many good memories when it comes to the AKA. It was, so, it was such a great event for me. I, I think um, we all probably have those events where it's like, man, every year this event comes around and this is the one where I always seem to do well, whether I like really earned it or not. Like I just, and what I mean by that is like, did I put in all of the trick? Like luck just falls your way. And like a lot of that is preparation, but sometimes it's just good luck in an event. I always did really well at AKA and Pan Ams. Uh, AKA was just one of those events, man. It's, I might've won Pan Ams more than I've won AKA to be honest with you. But AK has the big, the warrior cup. And it's like, so you, you, you hear about that more. Um, but I guess you got to start with the first one. Uh, Cause I think I was the first person to ever win weapons and fighting at the same event. I think Mike Bernardo might've won forms in fighting. Yeah. I, I was about to say, I think you might be the only, not just the first, but to win forms and fighting or weapons okay. and fighting at the same event. Anyway. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that was, that was crazy. That was my first NASCA event as an adult. Um, so that, that was really cool too. So I guess that probably makes me the youngest also, but you know, who's counting, um, you know, it was, it was a cool like lead up to it. So a lot of things, uh, people that don't know, um, rewind before this is back when AK was in October, October, 2005. I think it was the last time it was in October. Um, so not quite as cold as it is now, but diamond nationals, I turned 18 like a week and a half after diamonds. Um, Cause at that, it was like October 2nd or something like that, that year. And AK was at the end of October. So I turned 18 in between. I had asked Larry Carnahan if I could move up at the diamonds and they said, no. And they said, no. And I was so upset. I was so upset because it was one of those diamond nationals where like you know, later in the career, it was like, all right, if Raymond, Jody, Tankson, if the, Trevor, those guys were in the building, one of them was going to win. None of them were there that year. And I'm like, I could win a diamond ring right now, like first shot out. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't think any of them were there that first year. But you didn't remember let, 105? That's making me think of who won that ring. Alex Lane, maybe. 
Uh, yeah, that that was like his prime. So that, that yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, one, I so. think so. If he if it wasn't that year, it was where you're after. But I, I don't remember. But in any case, I, it was like, man, I want to get a diamond ring, and they wouldn't let me move up. So I, I washed through my division. Was like, I can't wait till AK. I'm gonna stick it to everybody. And I got there, and I was crazy nervous. Um, I fought teams with uh, with Alex Dingman and Bernard Paquette. Uh, we did pretty well. We made it to stage, and then um, yeah, we did the rest of the division. I think I dropped in musical and then one creative or, or the other way around dropped in creative one in musical. I had one entry into the, the forms of weapons. Um, so when I got to the, uh, the overall for weapons, they, I'm assuming it's different now because everyone was in it. Men and women were in the warrior cup. It was one. It was one. And boy, it was stacked. Like, Lauren Carney was in the in, in there. John Sue did double whip chains. Um, Caitlin DeShell, if I'm not mistaken, might have been up there. Um, Jonathan Boyd was in there. And I want to say, or maybe not Caitlin, I think Terry Jacoby. Mm-hmm. Maybe one other. I can't remember. But it was like, at that time, it was like stacked. And uh, I just went out and crushed my form and, and won it. I think I actually went last, which probably helped. And I went no music. So I probably won creative because I, I didn't use music. I do remember that. Um, and I was like completely shocked. And, like I, I, I knew I had nailed my form. I had a really good crowd ovation. Um, so I, I was pretty surprised to win. So that was really cool. And like at that point, I was like, all right, my weekend was great. I won my division. Um, you know, I, I made it to the runoffs. I had to fight Larry Tanks and Senior. And then if I won that, I would fight Ryan McGriff who would later become my teammate. Um, I was actually kind of nervous because back then it would come down to the final three fighters. It would be the lightweight, the heavyweight, and then the 30 plus. Mm -hmm. And then what would happen is you'd have to do like, based on the grand, whoever won by the biggest point spread would get the buy automatically. Mm. Okay. It was kind of cool, but I like that. Yeah. So, so Larry Tankson senior won his fight by one or two. Myself and Ryan McGriff both won by a five. It was only a five point spread back then too, uh, in the divisions. So they had us do a one point sudden death, me and Ryan to determine who got the buy. And Ryan McGriff, for those of you who don't know, probably the craziest leg, like front leg, just weird. It, it wasn't like Zolt Marathi, super technical. It was, it just like came from funky angles. This dude must've kicked me in my face. I don't know. It was so fast. The judges missed it on like four exchanges. I'm not even joking. He <laughs> kicked me in my face like three times before they finally gave him the overtime point. And I remember going back to my room after calling Jody, Jody Tension, my coach, being like, dude, I just got kicked in the face like 40 times. What am I going to do? And he's like, listen, just stick to your back fist, stick to your back fist, stick to your side kick, kick his leg. He's like, beat Larry Tankson first. And then stick to your back fist. And I did just that. And I came away with the second Warrior Cup. It was wild, man. Crazy weekend. That is crazy. So I got to ask if everybody that watches the show regularly saw this coming because I'm the weapons guy, right? So in that weapons division, right, what was like the – what do you think it was that puts you over the top? Because you were – and I remind people about this on this show all the time because you don't get enough respect for being literally a pioneer of bow tricking. You and obviously Nate Andre were ex- essential to the development of what Bo is today, right? And people just don't realize that anymore. So at the end of that form, I know you said you went last, and obviously it had to be a good form. But what were the moves in that form that you think put you over the legends that you were competing against? I mean, you're talking about a whole bunch of, of Paul Mitchell people that have won many U.S. Opens and Black Belt Hall of Famers and mm-hmm. all of that, right? So – what was it that you feel like the, the unique tricks in that form that set you apart? I'm trying back then I wasn't really throwing the crazy stuff that people hadn't seen. Like I, I think I was the first one to land voodoo child, uh, land anti-gravity in competition. I don't think I, I think straight jacket and like a shoulder neck roll were like the craziest things. It might've been the first time people had seen the, the behind the back palm spin. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it wasn't like, 
I didn't get the crazy ovation from the moves that I was doing, the manipulations. Like it, it, it wasn't as groundbreaking stuff as like when you were coming out with some of the crazy stuff you did. Like it wasn't that far and beyond what people were already doing. I think it was just timing, man. I, I had um, Nate, I actually called Nate up and I was like, hey man, I, I made it to stage. Like this is crazy, so cool. And um, he was like, who are you competing against? And uh, we're going down the list. And he's like, don't use music. And I was like, okay. He's like, don't fight fire with fire. He's like, they're all going to use music. Don't use music. Be different. Cool. All right. So I think it was a combination of like, those guys had been winning for so long and girls had been winning for so long and doing so well. And kind of recency bias, right? I was the new guy. I was like a fresh a fresh face and no music and I was intense and I nailed my form and I went last and like perfect storm and it worked out. Yeah. I don't think I really did anything that spectacular. I think it was just a, a good form at the right time and the right place. Right. And, and I'll admit sometimes that's what it is, right? Cause if you mm -hmm. had flipped that around and asked me the same question, there are some warrior cups where it's like, Oh yeah, I did this crazy thing and that's why I won. But there's others where it's like, I stuck to a plan. Like, so-and-so mm -hmm. dropped and then this person like looked off that night and I was going last. So I made adjustments and I did my form and won, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I think there is a lot to be said for that. Cause I do think that often we, we romanticize <laughs> the major titles and like the form that it took to win them. And sometimes the form that you did in the division was a heck of a lot better than the form that actually won on stage. But that's yeah. besides the point. Now I want to talk about fighting where by itself, you've also got the most, fighting warrior cups of all time you mentioned getting that first one against ryan mcgriff across those i guess it was eight of them right across those warrior cups where did you feel like you encountered the biggest challenge was it that first one and overcoming that leg was there a, a titan matchup and one of the other ones what was your greatest point fighting challenge there were there were a lot man i actually um warrior cup was one of those crazy events where i fought my teammates a lot I ended up fighting my teammates a ton. I think I fought Hamad, Hamed Ferruzzi twice. Mm -hmm. I fought Avery twice. I fought Jason Grenier once. I remember you fighting and Jason Grenier. Yeah. Five, yeah. That's five right there. Yeah. And then I want to say, I'm trying, if I go back, um, I definitely fought Tom Roberts for one. Can't remember the others. I remember some of the runoffs. I know I fought Nate Thorne in one of them. I fought Dewan Brown in one of them. Might have fought Elias Lemon once. That might have been all of them. But yeah, man, it's like I fought so many of my teammates. Like, it, it, and that's crazy because I fought my teammates a lot, you know. And like I fought Hamad, Hamed Ferruzzi a ton of times, and he was always such a hard fight. Short, lefty, weird axe kick, throws things at funny angles, hit hard for his weight class. Like he was super tough. Avery, impossible to kick against. You can't kick that guy. Jason Grenier, I think that might have been the only fight I ever beat him by more than one point. I think the the many times Jason and I fought, it was always a one point decision. Like it's just crazy, man. And like I I man managed to come out on top, you know, multiple times at the AKA Grands. It was just one of those events I was just dialed in all the time. That's awesome. And so the natural next question is, as you were going through probably several streaks of Warrior Cups in a row in there, and as they're starting to stack up, at what point was it where you realized that you were chasing a record where it was a historic feat? Because I remember for me, it wasn't even on my radar until the, uh, the only reason I bring this up is because it's hilarious. Um, I walk out on stage going for my sixth, which was my second to last one. And uh, Mike Chat, who was on the mic, he says something about, and will he break my record? And I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't even know. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. he said, I'm literally walking on stage to do my form. And then I'm like, oh, apparently my chat has five Warrior Cups. Good to know. Mm -hmm. And then and then in the back of my mind, I'm like, how is this affecting the judges right now? Do the judges want me to beat my chat? Like, this is kind mm -hmm. of weird. Uh, but so for me, like, that was the moment where I was like, oh, like, this number matters. It means something. What was that moment for you? When, when did it feel important more important so, than another cup so i don't even think i knew until after like honestly and no disrespect to mike chat i didn't know he was the guy i thought it was mike bernardo 
I thought Mike Bernardo had the most, or maybe he had the most overall because I know he had won forms weapon. Well, and, and we don't know what record chat was talking about. It could have been his personal okay. record. It could have been okay. weapons. I, 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 got it, got I don't got know it. what record he was talking. About. Yeah, I, I thought Mike Bernardo was the guy, and we'll need someone to stat check that. But um, I was always under the impression that it was Bernardo, and I didn't find out that I was close because I think Mike Bernardo had six or seven, uh, like total. Same thing. Like he had won forms fighting and I believe he won weapons as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it wasn't until I was maybe one away from Mike Bernardo that somebody had mentioned it. And then I checked it with him because I went to the Canadian Open and I was like, hey, how many war cups do you have? All right, I, I'm gunning for that. <laughs> and uh, and then it was just like after I met that record, it's like, all right, let's break the record. And then every time I showed up, it's like, let's just get another one and another one. And I think I ended up beating him by two. But it was never a thing of like, I need the record. It's just, I want to win. Like all the, all that stuff. Like, it's funny, man. Um, Jody says, it. you know, recently, I believe it was in the, I won't say his name too loud, Kanye, his, uh, his documentary, uh, his, where his mom said that giants don't recognize how big they are until they look up. Right. So it's like, I was never chasing records or trying to be like the guy who won the most. I was just trying to be the guy that won period. End of story. I just want to win. And now looking back on it, it's like, you got the most cool. You know, it's, it's just a nice, like it's a cherry on top for other people to talk about. You know, if you get into the habit of talking about your own records too much, you, you got to question what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I agree with that for sure. I love that. And uh, so now we've reflected, we've told the stories and uh, I think you've proven to everybody that, that you're a good person to talk about when it's <laughs> So now let's shift, right? Let's look at today. Defending Warrior Cup champion coming into, I guess, two weeks from now. Uh, D Stacks, Darren Payne from Next Level. Uh, so he won last year. Looking at the field, because I know that you keep up with the sport at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you also coach some guys still through Turbo Sports Performance, as well as just sharing your point fighting hours, right? Right. So looking at the field that we could have going into Warrior Cup this year, who are some of those guys that you think because of the, the way the bracket is set up and the way Warrior Cup is, uh, or just because they're great fighters, who are those guys that, that we should expect to see in that Warrior Cup final? Yeah, great question. Um, it was uh, that event for D Stacks, and this is an important stat, you might know the answer to this, was that his first ever overall? Was that his first overall grand championship? I, I believe, believe it because I, I, I believe it was. I, I believe it might have even been his his NASCA adult debut, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah Jesse so Ray tunes in sometimes. Jesse Ray, if you're here, fact check that for us, please. Yeah, yeah, please, please let me know. I, I believe it was his first NASCA overall grand championship. So we'll, we'll clear that up. But the reason I say that is because you know, since since my tenure ended, if you look across the span of Warrior Cup winners it seems to be pretty staggered and it always seems to be someone new kind of popping in and, and winning on an off year or, you know, when like me and Ray wouldn't show up, like somebody else would win it, you know? And um, like, there was a time in there that Kevin Walker won and it was kind of like, wow, Kevin, like he wasn't winning before. And then he wins at warrior cup. Warrior cup is that event where you see these young rising stars come up and they pop in and they win. Um, so, you know, someone like D stacks who it's like, his first time, you know, people don't recognize him. And all of a sudden he comes in there, the underdog, and he wipes everybody out. So will he defend? I don't know. But it all depends on who goes, right? So you have like the, the betting favorites. If Avery shows up, if Elijah shows up, Bailey, Enrique Latona, like you got those guys who are still like, those are the studs, right? Those are the guys who, the thoroughbreds that you expect to go and win those races all the time. Um, but you're going to see some guys that are right on the cusp, like my, my guy, Alex Mencius, right? Uh, very close at his last event to, to going out and maybe like a point or two away from getting to that overall grants, you know? And um, I think he's right on the edge and just ready to take that next step. And this might be the event where he could do that. Uh, another person who um, I've had the pleasure of actually training for a short period of time when he was really young, like underbelt, Christian Rivas. Uh, Christian is awesome, man. Such a good guy. Good. I say good kid, but he's a good guy. Young man. Um, phenomenal fighter. Like I would love to see Christian go and go in there and get a warrior cup. Um, yeah, I think those are uh, Tyson Ray. You yeah. know, let's, let's see if Christian's Tyson gets been, in there. Christian's been hot lately too. I got to throw that in there. Second, second half of the season, he was winning uh, heavyweight mm -hmm. grants left and right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and beating a lot of guys that, you know, had been doing it for a little while. So I think you're you're always going to see like kind of new fresh blood at the AKAs. And and I think it has to do with being the first tournament of the year, right? You want to go out there, you want to make a statement. And um, for me, that was that might have been another reason why it was I was always so successful is like you have that gap to really train and, you know, you go through the entire year and there's a major event almost every single month. And I think a lot of times we get caught up in like we're training for the events and not training for improvement. So you go tournament to tournament and you're the same person, you're the same fighter, same competitor all through the year. And then you don't get that time to truly develop. So, you know, maybe we're going to see some new developments from the last event was what November early, late October, early November was Pan Am's right. And there was Pan Am's. Then it was also Toronto. And Toronto, yeah, and but not everyone goes to Toronto because of the NASCAR points and blah, blah, blah. The, everyone should go to Toronto. Mike Politi is the man. Um, but yeah, like you see that gap from like Diamonds, Pan Ams, Toronto. Not everyone's going to hit those. But then there's a gap till February, so you're going to really see some nice improvements. And I think this is a, a good chance for a young gun to to make us make a mark. I think that's a great analysis, and I agree with you. I think that there's a lot of these young fighters, and, and there's some that we've missed out on specifically at Warrior Cup for several years. For <laughs> Bailey, it was always during track season. Is he able to make the trip this time? Mm. For a guy like Elijah, he's from England, and I don't want to start a rumor mill, but I did see an Instagram post from Elijah at a Kobe Bryant mural, which appeared to be in California, so he mm. could be on American soil right now. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just saying. Is. I'm just saying, if y'all pay attention, you might put some things together. But hey, anyway, never I, know. I could get a DM from Elijah being like, bro, what are you talking about? Anyway. Well, I know, I know the answer, but I can't disclose that information. So you never know. <laughs> I love it. Um, so now, next thing that I wanted to talk about, because it's so easy with how deep this division is right now, especially on the lightweight side, to talk about the men's fighting. But I also want to make sure we discuss women's fighting a little bit. I was just going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. It's in some ways easy to discuss because everybody knows if one person shows up, that is going to be the odds on favor. Say her name, say her name. Exactly. I'm going to go ahead and give you that alley-oop to talk about Morgan Plowden. And it, it's easy to say, well, yeah, we think she's going to win the warrior cup if she's there, but I've talked about this on the show before and how historically great Morgan is. And, and I don't want it to come from a forms and weapons guy anymore. Right. Can you speak just a little bit and feel free to talk about the other fighters that have a chance this year too. But speak a little bit to Morgan and how great Morgan actually is and how we should appreciate that. Well, I mean, just think about the environment, right? Think about the environment she came up in. She, she was one of the only females in, in a, a room that had so much legacy, so much success. I mean, it, she's bound for greatness. And um, all she had to do is be disciplined. It's really all she had to do. It follow directions and be disciplined, be smart be active in the room, ask questions. And like, she's the consummate professional. She's does everything she's asked, everything she's told. She trains her behind off, overcomes adversity. She's been through injuries. Like there's no denying it. She's, she's the best ever, you know, and, and I will go ahead and say the best ever because, you know, you look at the longevity and she's crossed a couple different decades already now. So um, yeah, like, can we, can we really compare to like Nikki? It's tough. But um, again, you know, like I can only speak from what I saw and what I experienced. And from my tenure in the martial arts and sport garage, the best that ever did it. So, you know, there, there's always going to be a couple of rivals. But, you know, where are the challengers? That's the real question is uh, it's not really about Morgan anymore. You know, we know what we have with Morgan and maybe we don't. I think she has more to improve, too. But that's not the question. The question is, where are all the females? Where are they? Why, and why are they not catching up? That's the question. I know what you mean. And I love what you mentioned there talking about like the, the whole Morgan and Nikki thing. And it's kind of like what I've heard people throw out there before about when people talk about like a, a Ray and a nasty, for example, it's like, mm -hmm. how do you compare those two fighters you can. who were so extraordinarily different? And by the end of this show, we are going to get to a little Mount Rushmore conversation, but Hey, if you're tuning in right now, make sure you stay tuned. Mm. Uh, but now I want to pivot back off of fighting and let's talk about the other thing that you have a warrior cup in. Let's talk about weapons, right? And you already mentioned some differences in the structure, and that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, so the way that it is structured today, point fighting sounds like it was actually pretty similar. They just include the open weight, so it doesn't have to apply anymore, right? Right. But in forms and weapons, the way that it has been recently, uh, so it's weapons is separate, so forms and weapons are separate warrior cups. And within weapons, and there's much debate about if this is the right way to do it, and I was, I was, I benefited from this format. 
So I'm mm-hmm. not going to join that discussion. But it is the men's weapons overall. They take that overall, uh, which is no longer including traditional. So they take the men's CMX weapons overall, the winner of the men's traditional weapons overall, which it's a little backwards to call it specific division and then say overall after that. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah. So the men's traditional weapons overall winner, the women's overall winner. So a female has to go all the way, win the overall grand to even get to the Warrior Cup now. Mm-hmm. And the 30 plus winner. And I think that if there's like I think if there's like a 30 plus male and female, they run those off. And then there's gonna be a senior representative. So got rather it. convoluted way of getting to it, but I understand the show can't be six hours long. So you gotta sure. go down somehow. And you do want several of the men in there because oftentimes it comes down to two of them. There's times that's not true, right? Mm-hmm. Ask Danny Smith, there's times that's not true. Um, but anyway, so now I've given you kind of the, the layout um, from who you've been following and who you've seen weapons forms of recently. Um, I know personally, because I you know, trained several of them intimately, um, that it's going to be stacked. But who is it that stands out to you as some people that could go in there and get an adult weapons cup? So I want to see the battle of the boyfriend and girlfriend. I want to see Alex Mancias and Haley Glass go head to head. And I want to see Haley beat his behind. That's what I want to see. <laughs> That's what I want. I want to see that because I want to call him after and be like, how did you <laughs> let that happen? How could you let that happen now? But Haley is amazing. So, I mean, that's who my money's on. I got my money on Haley Glass. Ooh, that's awesome. I love that. So, it's so looking out for your homeboy. Hot take. Alex, hot take. <laughs> that's my homegirl, too. You know, that's my homegirl, too. Of course, Haley's of great. Course. Absolutely. And I think that you have. Does it get better than that storyline, right? Uh, but of course, the bow guy, you know the bow guys. I mean, you're a bow guy too. Mm-hmm. Train out. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to talk about bow guys that I train. Um, so of course, we've got two new faces in the adult division and Esteban Tremblay and Ben Jones. Mm-hmm. Esteban, dominant throughout last Phenomenal. season. Ben, very creative. You never know what he's going to come out with. Mm-hmm. So both of them being an adult is really interesting. And then another bow guy, a guy that's got five Warrior Cups himself and Jake Presley. Mm-hmm. He's the defending Warrior Cup champion weapons. There's no reason he can't show up and go get another one. Um, Dawson Holt with Sword. He's one of the best Sword competitors. Super talented. A long yeah. time, right? And if you yeah. guys have noticed, I'm naming all the Paul Mitchell people. I know. Uh, anyway, of course. Of course I got to do that. Well, I got to uh, cut you off for a second. So just, just so we're on it, who's the last female to win the Warrior Cup, Weapons Warrior Cup? In the adult division? I in this In know. this format. In, in this format, in the adult division, it, it hasn't happened as, as far as I can remember. I know there's been junior weapons Warrior mm-hmm. Cup winners. Uh, Michaela Johnson did it. Audrey Donahue did it. Uh, yep. And I know because they both beat me to get there. Uh, Caitlin Michelle. If I had to guess, my guess would be Caitlin Michelle. Yeah. If, if I had to guess again, I mean, it, it might go as far back as like a Ming Lu. Because I know Ming Lu has that diamonds record. Mm-hmm. She's the only woman to win the diamond ring in weapons before they split it between men and I don't. I don't know that. Um, I don't know that the Warrior Cup was giving, or, or AKA Grands was giving women's Warrior Cups. If they were, if they were, they might not have for fighting because one of my Warrior Cups, or actually maybe they they definitely did. Oh, they weren't for a while for fighting because I donated one of them to Verona when right, she won. I that. My teammate Verona. Um, yeah, so so they stopped for a while. So I don't know. I don't know if Ming has any Warrior Cups. Like maybe an overall weapons grand, but maybe not a Warrior Cup. Um, yeah. So I mean, even more reason why I got Haley Glass to win it. I want to see. I want to see a female go and take that down. That would be cool. I love that take. All right. So moving on. Now we're gonna, we're done talking about Warrior Cup. I'm sure we'll float back around to it at some point. Uh, but now. <laughs> Probably the the biggest thing, at least in the public eye that you've been doing recently, is fighting in karate combat and, of course, becoming karate combat's middleweight champion. I know making the entire sport karate community very proud to see you you go and and have that achievement in a a full contact sport. So first, Mm -hmm. just like we did with the Warrior Cup, I want to give you a chance to reflect. Take us back to that title fight against Shaheen Adamov and uh, what it felt like, both in the heat of the moment when you're going through the fight, um, because... In my opinion, you were pretty in control of that fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To talk about that experience and then, of course, getting the belt. Yeah. So, I mean, it even goes back before that. You know, if if I recap my entire karate combat tenure so far, which is only three fights, um, which itself has been a whirlwind, right? They kind of, they brought me in. 
they rode me straight to the top. I mean, I'm very grateful for that. Um, but it's, it's been fast, man. It was, it was a fast rise and, and I tore through the top of the division pretty quick. You know, I fought Grinovich who, um, was Owen two in karate combat, but like had experience. He was taller as his first time in 85. So he was bigger than me. Um, and in that event, I, it was COVID traveled to Budapest, fought behind a green screen. Like mo most people don't know that it, the, the event was crazy. And just like th those were not fans in the background. Those were paid actors and actresses because during COVID, the only people that could be on a movie set, which is where they filmed it, were actors and actresses. So the only people that were there were the staff, the fighters, the coaches, the referees and judges, and these actors and actresses. That's it. Um, so, so that was crazy. And like just having that experience and like learning how to use the pit and just like getting over those nerves, a lot of new things, right? New time fighting in little gloves, you know? So a lot, a lot of first times there and, and I was able to be successful. Um, my second fight with Igor de Castaneda, they uh, started building a little more press behind it. Now they were allowing fans in. So I was able to bring my manager, Tyson Chartier. And um, if you guys are familiar with the UFC, um, you know, UFC featherweight, featherweight, Calvin Cater, featherweight, I believe. Yeah, because he uh, yeah he's he's in featherweight, oh, in, in in yeah, yeah, yeah. featherweight. Calvin Cater. So Calvin took the trip out with us, and they hung out. So it was cool to have some more people around. Um, and uh, you know, had a really good that was like really dialed in. Um, had an awesome fight there. Some people say it stopped too early. I say I would have hurt him pretty bad if it continued. But um, I was able to win that title eliminator fight, and now boom, right to a title fight. And so that was from like. February, I fought earlier in the year. Uh, and I remember that because we got stuck in Budapest because there was a huge snowstorm in Boston. So we got a three day in Budapest, uh, which was cool. Um, and then it was like right into training camp for my title fight. Now, I'll, I believe this might be the first time I'm sharing this. Um, I had several, several bad injuries going into that fight. Um, I had my very first sparring day which was like eight weeks out. Um, one of my training partners tried to sweep me, not his fault, tried to sweep me. And I was just too hunkered down and had a, a really bad sprain in my MCL. So now I'm not sparring, just lifting weights, hitting pads, recovering my knee, because there's no way I'm pulling out of a title fight. It's not happening. I, I had to fight then July 4th weekend, Universal Studios, Orlando, like I got to do this on home soil. I'm not missing this opportunity. So I have that injury. And then three weeks before the event, I'm deadlifting. I pull my back. I'm like, oh, that didn't feel good. Okay. I think it was just because I was avoiding my left knee. So I tweaked my right side, my right lower back. So I wait another week. I get back to my deadlift. I pop it again. So now I'm like completely incapacitated. My knees jacked up. My back hurts. I'm like, how the heck am I about to go fight this animal? And like Shaheen's tough, man, like tough, comes forward, hits hard, grapples. I'm like, oh boy, but we're going to make it happen because I'm not turning it down. And like, no joke, I just did everything I possibly could to recover. I had my coworkers working on me, you know, my strength and conditioning coach, like every, my nutritionist, everyone was just all about how do we get you as close to hundred percent as possible on fight day. And like, if I fought on Saturday or Friday, Saturday, I believe. Um, that Thursday, I woke up and I'm like, I think I'm going to be good <laughs> for a world title fight. So, you know, I had a lot, of, a lot of, um, a lot of tribulations going into that fight, and uh, you know, to get there and just adrenaline kicks in, you just go, man, you just go. And um, I was pretty banged up after that. Uh, in in the fourth round, he had dumped me. I remember thinking like, it's probably going to hurt later. And uh, by the time I got back to the medical tent, like my wife had to put my shoes on for me. Like my back was really jacked up. Um, but you know, in the moment you just go for it. And, uh, what a, what a hell of a fight, um, to reflect on it. Truthfully, I didn't think I was winning. And I know a lot of people are like, are you serious? I, I didn't think I was winning. I, I had no idea. I thought we were going to an extra round. Um, I did not think I was in control of that fight. And, and I think it, when I look back on it and I rewatch it, I, I can clearly see that I dominated a, a significant amount of the fight. But in the moment, first round, I felt really good. Dropped him at the end of the first round. Second round, I didn't really get off the way I wanted to. 
third round, I even felt worse than I did in the second. The fourth round, I picked it up. And in the fifth round, I, I kind of felt like we were a little even. So I, I really didn't, I didn't know. I really didn't know at the time. My coach is like, you got this, you won. And I was like, are you sure? Like, are you guys positive? Um, if you go back and watch it, at the end of the fifth round, when I go back to the corner and I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my coach. Um, he's talking to me, congratulating me. And I mouth to him, it's over. And he's like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. I had no idea. I thought I was losing the fight. Yeah, it was crazy, man. I think that's just the internal pressure I put on myself to perform. And I know what I'm capable of. And I didn't, I didn't get a chance to give what I was capable of. And that's why I think I felt like I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. For sure. Crazy perspectives there going from yeah. <laughs> that you dealt with going into it, which how would anybody ever know that, right? Because right. uh, you didn't look it in the ring. Like you mm. looked totally fresh. You looked like yourself from the first round, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's where it comes from saying that hey, you looked in control of the fight, dropped him at the end of the first. Uh, but I totally get what you're saying about how when you're in that moment, I can imagine how you want to win so bad that you're never really certain if you're if you're winning, right? And so I want to talk a little bit about the experience with karate combat, because I think that anybody who watches can tell this is very different from mm -hmm. anything else that we've watched before, right? Like <laughs> you watch UFC, you watch one championship, you watch Bellator, mm -hmm. you see MMA, like there's an agreed upon understanding of what that looks like. Karate combat, of course, very limited ground game. I think there's like the three seconds you've got five hit which five seconds, thank you. Mm. Um, you've got the pit, which is obviously another factor. And then also, especially for that first fight, the arena itself is very different from, from what fight yeah. fans in general are accustomed to seeing. And oh, by the way, you've got George St. Pierre and, and Bass Rutten and those guys just sitting there watching you, right? Mm. So tell us about that whole experience <clears throat> and how weird it is and how cool it is. Just get into all the ins and outs of that. Yeah, I mean, Karate Combat's fantastic, man. I mean, um, I've been in a couple of different professional fight leagues. I've been in Glory. I fought for Lace Up Promotions. I fought in Dubai. And uh, and obviously now in Karate Combat. Um, karate Combat is, is run by martial artists, you know, guys that are invested, that, ha that are not just businessmen. These are guys that have done it at a high level. Adam Kovacs is a world champion. You know, this guy's elite in the WKF arena, like people people know his name, you know, so um, to have him at the head, it brings a different level of respect and understanding for the fighters. You know, of course, it's a business, of course, it's a business, and it has to be right, like any other fight promotion, but there is a sense of understanding that the fighters make the promotion. Um, and that's something that's really cool and really honorable and something that I hadn't gotten the full taste of in my career because glory was such a big business, right? You got all these guys, some of the guys making a lot of money at the top and a lot of guys making a little money at the bottom, just trying to scrape their way through. And I was one of those guys, you know, just trying to make a splash and make it. Um, then you get to karate combat and you get this vibe that the promotion is what it is because of us, not because of the businessmen behind it. Um, so it's just really nice to be appreciated by the people at the top where you don't usually see that. You know, and it's people who are approachable. How often can you go into a building and ask to speak to the CEO and they come to you and, hey, Ross, how you doing? You know, how you feeling? You've been training hard. Like you're, you're valued, you know, you feel valued. And that's really, really cool. Um, so that's the first time I've really felt that, which is really nice. Um, so with that being said, the personalities that are involved, I mean, it doesn't get better. Boss Root and Boss is the man. You know, everything you think of him, and you know what? I can say that across the board for every personality they've brought in. Boss Rutten, George St. Pierre, Leonel Machida, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. For people who have never met them, what you see is exactly what you get. If you see Boss Rutten and you're like, that dude's crazy. Yep, he's crazy. <laughs> and he's awesome. And he's hilarious. And he's massive. Like, super cool. George St. Pierre, reserved, but like super friendly. Loves martial arts. We'll talk to anybody. Wonder Boy Thompson, the NMF, he's a hundred percent. He's the nicest person on the planet. I don't know how he does what he does. And uh, Machida, just like the legend, man. Just It's so cool to be around people like that and get to rub shoulders and bump elbows and kind of get what I call the rub, right? I'm always asking those guys questions and picking their brain and trying to get a little piece of, of them 
so I can then put it back out. So that's crazy. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the environment I've been through all of it, I've been through no fans, green screen, where the audience is like clap now and they don't really know what they're clapping at to the first live show back, which is my element. So it's, it's been a wild ride, man. And I, I can't wait for what's next. That's awesome. And the perfect segue, what is next, right? You're the champ. You're the one that gets to look down at the rest of that middleweight division. And you, you are the gatekeeper. You determine what comes mm -hmm. next, who's going to get the chance to fight for that belt. Um, and the next time we see you, you'll be wearing that cool gold black belt that, that, that they put on you during the fight, right? Um, Maybe, so yeah. I, I'm actually, um, I know I know I'm supposed to. I, I believe I'm the only fighter who, who wears his own belt. So um, every other fighter, they give you a Karate Combat logo black belt to wear. And I was adamant that I wear my own belt. Mm -hmm. um, competed in my belt for years. This is the, the fourth degree that, that Jotty Tension promoted me with. And that belt does not leave my waist when I compete. So I'm going to argue that I want to continue to wear that belt. Um, but I understand if, if I have to wear the gold belt, um, I may actually ask them if I can embroider it. You know, as long as I'm the champion, can I embroider the gold belt with the TCK? You know, because that's that's me. That's my belt. That's my background. That's what I train. And that's what I want to represent. You know, and Jody and I always have conversations like, listen, man, I'm bringing you into the ring with me. That's into the pit. This is what it is. So, you know, maybe they'll let me keep wearing my belt. Who knows? I'll be the first. Um, but yeah, I love it's, it's so much. And I, I'm, I'm going to pause right there because I know we're going to talk about who, who you're going to fight next, potentially who you're looking at. Right. But that is so much cooler than that conversation. Uh, I've got so much respect for that. And I know that nobody at Karate Combat probably cares about what I have to say. However, if anybody from Karate Combat watches this show and I hope that everybody who tunes in does, does put a hashtag in the comments or something. Let Ross keep that belt because that is far cooler than wearing any gold belt that they could slap on him. Uh, and that that's the best thing that I've heard like all year, which isn't Thanks, man. It's only been like two weeks. But well, the year just started. Yeah. <laughs> that's the coolest thing I've heard. I love that. Thanks, um, man. So Thanks. hopefully we get to see you wearing your fourth degree black belt. Um, and, and listen, if not, the, the gold belt is sweet. The gold belt is sweet. It's a really, it's a really cool touch. Um, I'm just particular, man. I, I, I want, I want the piece of me. I want me in the ring. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I'm not disrespecting the fact that I'm the champion. That's what champions do, blah, 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 whatever. I know in the UFC, you get the gold outfit and all that. And your, your championship attire looks different. I get it. It's my belt. I want to wear my belt. I like it. So That's now, what got me there. Right. 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 So now let's get to who who are some of those names that you're looking at. And by the way, I'm going to give the disclaimer for you here. Guys, whatever he says right now doesn't mean that Karate Combat's going to make that fight. It does like y'all don't read into this. This is just Ross mm -hmm. talking about who he might fight. Um, so go ahead and tell us like who are some of those people on your radar. Or if you're just like, I don't care, throw somebody at me. I have zero information on what's next. Um, I can, because I don't have a contract in front of me. I haven't signed anything. I don't know when the next event is. They haven't announced it. Um, they do a really good job of keeping things kind of on the hush. And it's like, let's go, we're going, which I kind of like, because it just lets me train blindly, um, which as a martial artist, I believe you should, right? We shouldn't train for a tournament. I shouldn't train for an opponent. I train for myself and that's how I get better. So I like the training blindly and I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, after my title fight, I took some time off, rehabbed, enjoyed the, enjoyed the victory with my, uh, my family and my wife and everything. And then um, we got back down to business after I was ready and, and cleared to continue training. So I tried to get on the October card and the December card. And um, I will say that it's not people accepting fights and pulling out. I've had several people straight up say no. Uh, which is very disheartening because as a professional fighter, your goal is to fight. So, um, <laughs> not for the not for the middleweight title, but the uh, the light the light heavyweight uh, title is vacant, and I've offered to fight uh, a number of fighters at two hundred five, who have all not signed on the dotted line. So, you know, I'm I'm willing to move up and fight at two hundred five. Although I believe, in my opinion, the next person in line will be a rematch with Igor de Castaneda. I think that will be next. I think it will be early this year. I don't have any definite information, but that's what I would like. I mean, I want to, you know, we say defend my title. Um, in my eyes, that title, that title was that moment. I'm not a champion in my eyes right now. 
I'm a champion when I go out and win it again. And that lasts for 24 hours. And then I'm back to being on the hunt. So, you know, you can't get content. It's easy to get content up there. I'm, that title is, I'm not even kidding you. I'm in, I'm in my wife's office. It's sitting on the couch. It's not in a big frame. It's not in a shadow box. It is literally on the couch next to a bunch of pillows and something that hasn't gotten hung up since our anniversary. So it's just sitting there, man. And it's not to say that it doesn't mean anything to me, but I'm not going to make this grand, you know, like uh, stage of like, oh, I'm the world champion. No, do it again. Like I got to go and do it again. So maybe that's a little jotty coming out in me, but I got to do it again, man. So, you know, I don't consider myself the champion anymore. That was that moment. I want to win another championship and I want to win it in another weight class. So I think Igor's next. Um, he deserves it. You know, there, there's a nice little story behind it. You know, we had the little beef and, um, you know, he said it was stopped too early. And then his next fight out, he went out and flatlined the guy. So cool. Let's do it. We'll run it back. Um, you know, in five round fight, I think that fares very well for me. That's awesome. And that is the mentality that made you a champion in the first place, right? Correct. That is the mentality why so many sport karate fans who know you are big Ross Levine fans, because that is one of those things that set you apart from everybody else. Um, and by the way, I love either of those storylines, whether we get Ross Levine champ champ or whether we get the rematch with Igor de Castaneda um, so that there's no question about who the best really is. Uh, because yeah. you are my bias for that one. Uh, but anyway, like, I, like both of those storylines, I can't wait to tune in and see that. Now, talking about storylines, I'm going to ask this on behalf of the sport karate community, because I know the sport karate community wants me to ask this, right? And honestly, when that Karate Combat had Ray debut at middleweight, it mm -hmm. got my wheels turning. I'm like, wait a minute. This is Ross's weight class. Obviously, you guys had great rivalries, great fights over the years between the two of you. I remember a particular one at AmeriKick. That's like one of my favorite fights ever. But nonetheless. One of my least favorite. Well, because of the outcome, I think, at the end, right? Yeah. Regardless. You, the, like, <clears throat> you beat him up for moments in that fight, too. But anyway. Yeah. So what I'm getting at here is that when that happened, me and a lot of others were like, oh, they're, they're trying to, to set this up. And they're like, no, and then Ray goes down, and then Ray takes a loss, which for sport karate as a whole, unfortunate, right? So mm -hmm. I'll let you speak to a little bit, just kind of the possibility, even though it seems less likely right now, of like maybe a fight with Ray in the future, because obviously sport karate fans would love to see that. Um, mm -hmm. and in general, your thoughts on that whole circumstance. Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on it um, and thoughts from both sides. Number one, I can see why the sport karate community would love to see us fight in this uh, this arena, right? They, they've seen us go head to head in super fights, in open weight, in point fighting. They've never seen us compete full contact. We both kind of had similar uh, stories. You know, Ray was doing it a little longer than I was, he did the World Combat League, you know, mostly due to his age. He was older than me. So he, he got there first, um, went to glory, got to the top, unfortunately didn't make it to that world title, uh, and then went to Bellator, won a world title. I get to glory, get cut short of making it to the top, like just getting ready to scrape the top 10, COVID hits. So it get, the rug gets pulled out from under me. So we didn't really get to see where I got there at that level. Um, and now we both seem to be karate combat, where now I'm, I'm a champion in karate combat, Ray comes in, debuts at middleweight, and the buzz is like right away. Um, and it is not just sport karate. Karate Combat wants us to fight. There's, they're not shy about it. They, uh, they pushed that from the beginning. They asked both of us. And uh, Ray and I had a conversation, and um, we both agreed, like, we want to support each other. You know, we fought each other a lot, more than most, right? Probably, I would say, in – in the time that I competed and the time Ray competed, I'm sure that he and I probably fought the most out of any other pair of competitors at that level. So, you know, um, I'm very, I'm very thankful that he, he wants to see me successful. Um, I want to see him succeed. I, I've always cheered for him in all of his fights. Um, so yeah, they, they did push that hundred percent, you know, and we have not had that moment. Um, you know, 185 is not his weight class. Uh, he was uh, not shy about talking about that afterwards as well. You know, he said he, he took it on short notice just to kind of get his feet wet and get in there and get a fight going. I know he had a lot of changes in his life in that period of time, you know, moving and getting married and having a baby and all that stuff. So um, I thought he looked phenomenal at 165. 
there's no way in hell I'm making 165. Uh, I don't even think I can make 175 anymore. I'm just, I mean, look at me, man. Look at, look at all this. I can't, I can't do that. My nutritionist won't let me. So, um, you know, it, if we did fight, first of all, we've both said it, you know, on numerous occasions, if that's the fight you guys want to make, let's see it, you know, let's, let's have some numbers behind it. Um, and I guarantee we'll sell out any arena. You know, that's, that's going to be an easy, an easy thing, you know, guaranteed. Um, just in sport karate fans alone. But, you know, again, like you said, maybe that gets put on hold now. You know, if, if he were to beat Agaev and then, you know, beat Quay Hagen, now that he's a champion, I'm a champion, they want to make something happen. I thought maybe we would have had an argument, but now it seems that that might be on hold for a little bit. I don't think for long, you know, Ray is, we all know Raymond knows how to adjust. Um, so, you know, I, I hope he gets that rematch and, um, you know, we'll see how it goes from there. Awesome. I think perfect analysis. And that's kind of what everybody in sport karate is hoping for. Like, it doesn't matter what team you were on in sport karate. Whenever we see one of our own make it to that level and, and do it, you know, on a, on a stage like karate combat, it doesn't matter who you played for. You're cheering for the sport karate guy. You know what I mean? So which, which puts me to the other side. And I'm surprised at how many people are still like so cutthroat with me and Ray. They're like, they have to fight. It's like, why can't you just support both of us and be like, we, it's a win for sport karate. Let's get two titles. You know, I, I was commenting on the, on all like the karate combat discord and all this stuff. I'm like, sport karate is about to get two world champions, you know, before his fight, unfortunately didn't work out that way. But yeah, it's like, so I understand the, like, let them kill each other. But I also don't understand, like, we got two of our guys. Holy crap. Like, how amazing is that? So I, I don't love that people are still picking sides. You know, I get it in the sport karate world when we were competing different teams, blah, blah, blah. But now that we're in the same environment, uh, I wish people were a little more like team sport karate, but hey, that's what it is. I agree with that too. I like that. And so now talking about team sport karate, I think that karate combat is, is kind of that perfect storm where it seems that elite sport karate fighters of certain styles, big asterisk there, mm. of certain styles, karate combat could be the perfect place for some of these guys to come and have success. So with you and the pulse of the sport karate community that you have right now, what are some point fighters that are out there active on the NASCAR circuit right now that you think, you know what, if, if they tried karate combat, we might have something. Zero. Mm. Zero. Um, and the reason I say that is not because I don't think they can be successful. The way I'm going to phrase it, it might hurt some people's feelings, but it's the truth. And I don't care if you don't like it. If you want to be in karate combat, listen up. You cannot be a point fighter and go to karate combat. You cannot. It will not work. You have to take time and develop skills as a kickboxer in Muay Thai. Now, now that knees are allowed, you have to wrestle or do judo a little bit. You have to put time into that. You cannot be. And that's why it's like elite point. It doesn't take an elite point fighter to be good at karate combat. Would it help? Sure. Yeah. I think any point fighter has an advantage if they take the time and, and develop those skills. You know, um, there it's it's a leaky faucet when you go in there and you're just a point karate guy, you know, and Robbie, uh, Robbie Lavoie, my man, we had the conversation, too. I was like, before you sign a contract, you got to get into a gym and start training. And he is. He's doing awesome. You know, and, and you see the results, you know, even even his first fight, he was challenged by a guy that came forward, just hard nose, came, kept coming forward. And it was tough for Robbie. And, you know, now he went back and is like he's continuing to develop and. You know, he went over and cross trained with Joe Valtellini. Like, you know, it's uh, I'm I'm trying to help these guys talk about like this is what you need. This is what's going to pave the way. Now, if someone didn't do point karate and had no idea who I was, they wouldn't look at me in karate combat and be like, "Oh, he's a point fighter." Mm -hmm. They'd say, "Oh, he's a kickboxer." Mm -hmm. Case in point, every time I go in there, they're like, "He's just a kickboxer." It's like, "No, dude, I got more world titles than you do." But um, but they they see me as a kickboxer because that's the style that is successful. So right now, if you are just a point fighter, can you be successful in karate combat? Nope, not happening. You got to put the time and work in. You have to. And I know it's going to hurt people's feelings, but it's the truth. 
But I'm glad that you provide that perspective because wh where I frame the question is from this idea of like, oh, if we ever want point fighters to be good full contact fighters, well, what is the bane of their existence in MMA? It is the fact that none of them have a ground game because we don't do anything remotely close to a ground game, right? Mm -hmm. and so when you look at like a karate combat, which is all stand up, you're like, oh, yeah, I can see it. But it, it's so valuable to get that perspective that you've got of like, wait a minute. Stand-up striking is not just stand-up striking no matter where you come from. There's a difference if you are a classically trained kickboxer, Muay Thai fighter, and you need some of that background to be successful in the pit. And I think that, honestly, like, I feel like there's probably some point fighters out there who are looking at maybe in the future making a transition to karate combat, and hopefully they hear this and that's their eye-opener. They're like, oh, wait, before I go do that and get knocked out, I need to learn how to leg kick or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Any additional yeah. thoughts on that or I mean per perfect example. Um, like like you said, any elite point fighters, it's like mm -hmm. eh, elite doesn't do the trick for me. Uh Romani Alicia, right? Romani. Romani was on straight up. You guys remember him. I guarantee if you see a picture of Romani right now, you'd be like, that 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 was Romani. That's the same Romani. So uh Romani um showed up. I was teaching kickboxing at Lozon MMA, Joe Lozon, UFC legend. I was teaching um you know, last year, last year, a year and a half ago in his gym, you know, just part time here and there, um, just helping some of his guys out. And all of a sudden, Romani shows up. I was like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I want to start kickboxing. I want to start MMA and this and that. I'm like, all right, cool. So we started talking and, um, you know, the gym was a little far for him. I was like, listen, if you're serious about this, you got to go to Hard Knocks. Uh, Hard Knocks Muay Thai is um, one of my striking coaches. Jake Manini is the uh, is the coach there. One of the coaches there. And um, I, I have so much faith in him. Jake was in my corner with uh, my, my full-time coach, Andrew Cornell, at my, my title fight. Um, but Jake's got a bunch of guys, and, and Romani started diving in. And I guarantee you, Romani was not – I mean, he was a good point fighter. He wasn't elite, never won overalls. He never – you know, he won his division here and there. He was good, um, but he wasn't an elite point fighter. You take him against the best point fighter in the world right now and in his weight class, and you put him in the pit, Romani dusts him in a round. You know, because he has, he's got an established striking game now. You know, the guy, the kid can box, he can kick, he can, and then you start adding in the point fighting. He can move, he's evasive, he's got footwork, he's got feints. And it's like, oh, okay, there's a level here. So a lot of times when I first got into karate combat, everyone was like, who should go? Who should go? And it's like the names that kept flying around were like the tough guys of the sport. You know, the guys who hit hard in point fighting like cam dawson like brandon Ballou, could they be successful yeah yeah they have that intestinal fortitude but not right now they would not be successful if they went in right now as good as i think they are they would have to really dedicate to the the kickboxing and, and muay thai and, and a little judo a little grappling just to taste it they got to do that first you know but that goes for anyone you don't have to be an elite point fighter you just have to use those skills to your advantage but you have to you have to learn how to kickbox. There's no way around it. That's the that's the secret sauce right now. You know, you look at the the most successful guys in karate combat. It's not the guys you think, right? It's it's the guys who have a kickboxing background who are starting to invade that also have a karate background. You look at now Gabriel Vargas. Even though he's not the champion, he's probably the front runner. And that guy's multiple time world champion kickboxer with the karate background. You got myself, kickboxer with the karate background. You know and you're seeing that more and more. Again, such a valuable perspective. And, and I really, <laughs> truly hope that any point fighters that think that they want to do that eventually listen to this part of the show and, and understand the perspective of somebody who has been there, is one of the all-time great point fighters. We're about to get to that. Um, and then also went and won a, a karate combat championship, right? Uh, it's such a valuable perspective. And, and I appreciate you using this platform to share that with some of these guys. And it's a good segue. Now I do want to talk about, as we get close to the end of the show, the fun podcast topic that everybody loves, right? And let, is let's talk about who's the best at this, who's the best at that, right? Mm -hmm. and so I want to make it easy and I'm, I'm interested to hear yours. And the reason I want to do this specifically with you on the show is because I have died on this hill so many times, and I know you're humble, so you're probably going to put your head down when I say this or whatever. But every time that somebody brings up, who's <laughs> your top five point fighters? Ross Levine will always be in my top five point fighters. And my position on that is that you cannot do the things that are essential to point fighting 
as well as Ross Levine did all of those things and win most often purely off the things that are the most essential. A defensive sidekick, a reverse punch, a back fist. If you were going to summarize sport karate in three moves, it's those three moves, and Ross mastered all of them and beat everybody with those three moves. And you can't tell me that that isn't a sign of greatness, right? And so I would put Ross in my top five. So there, there, that is how I preface this. But I want to know, we'll go, you can go Mount Rushmore, you can go top five, whatever, whatever fits uh, your opinions better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what, what is yours? What is, who's on that point fighting Mount Rushmore in your eyes? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's tough because like, how do you, again, it's kind of like the the conversation we talked about before of like Nikki and, and Morgan, like, can, do you really, is it fair to blend eras? In my opinion, not really. Like, because those st- the statistics were different. The game was different. It's like comparing basketball in the early 90s to it's comparing Jordan and LeBron. Way more physical game compared to a way more physical player who is like physically above and beyond, but he doesn't get played as hard. So it's it's like different, but like both phenomenal athletes and the best in their regard in their time. So You know, if you ask me to do it in the era that I remember, that I saw, whether it was me watching from the stands or being in there doing it. So for me, even though, yes, nasty because of his, just his name, period. He he was nasty, right? He was the guy. Um, and, And, you know, rest in peace and like all of that. Does he belong on there? Absolutely. Can I put him in there? Because I never, I never saw him fight in person. So let's, let's preface it by saying that if I take that out of it, right. So I take away like that generation, you take away like nasty Pedro, Billy, those are guys that would come way before all of us on the Mount Rushmore. But let's talk about my run, my, my Mount Rushmore, who do I think are the best guys? Um, And I'm going to do this, not including myself because Come on, like you, you're putting yourself <laughs> on the list. You're a jerk. Nobody um, wants to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to be that guy. So for me, Jotty Tension, um, and, and I say this obviously with bias because that's my guy. Jotty's my coach. I've been with him since I was 16. Um, he might as well be my brother. He might as well be my dad. Like, I don't care. That, that guy's everything to me. Um, Jotty Tension, the smartest, like you say I'm a cerebral fighter. It's his brain in my body and he's got the joysticks, right? That's, that's Jotty Tension, number one. And the only reason I think that he w- that people don't recognize him like they recognize Raymond is Jotty took four years off. But people forget that he was dominant beforehand and dominant when he came back. And he also, he won Waco before Raymond did. So he won a Waco gold medal. That This is me on my soapbox making my case for my guy. Um, one Waco before, you know, when they first started going overseas, when they didn't know who these guys were, you know, before YouTube and before all that stuff, they had no idea what they were walking into and he was going out there and winning. So, you know, you got to give credit where it's due. Um, so yeah, but didn't go to the Irish open, you know, as much and and didn't win. I don't, I don't actually know if he's ever been to the Irish open maybe once. I don't know. I think he did and got hurt. I I believe he might've been there the year that Mike P went. I I don't know. I I, got to cross check that, but um, yeah, Jotty tension. Of course, Raymond Daniels, you have to put them one, a one B Ray was the most dominant force in my era. Start to finish, you know, Raymond beat me up when I was 16. And um, from that point on, it was just, I'm going to beat that guy as many times as I can. And I did. Um, so you gotta, you gotta give that, um, Trevor Nash, one of the two people I've never, three people I've never beaten. Uh, Trevor Nash is one of them. And, uh, I I love Trevor. I thought that dude is amazing. Um, I wish I would have got to fight him more. Um, as I was coming up, he was on the tail end of his career. So, and I, I give Trevor, if I'm ranking like one, two, three, four, five, I give Trevor a slight edge over Tankson because I think Trevor has a winning record over tanks and in the big moments, like I I think diamond rings, like diamond ring matchups. I think Trevor won more um, against Jason. Jason might have more rings again. Fact check me on that. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, Trevor was just different man and mean. God was he mean. So I go, I go Jotty, Raymond, Trevor, 
tanks in. And five is where it starts to get a little fuzzy. There's a lot of names up for grabs too. Right, right. Um, I'm like on the Rolodex is spinning. Right. I got I got to watch Brian Ruth compete. Mm, yep. But Every- it's like, but it's man, if you have to tier like five A, five B, five C, it's like Brian Ruth, young Preston Clements, um, uh, 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 Brian Plemple. BP was a savage. Is Mike Palmero in that conversation for you? Because I was always a huge Mikey P fan, but it, I, 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 I wear, I wear I my black and white bias. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't get a chance to see Mike compete as much. Mm-hmm. So for me, no. As much as I love Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm probably closer to Mike, and we're not super close, but like we communicate every now and then. I call him Uncle Mike. <laughs> I, I love Mike. When I got offered to be on Paul Mitchell, because I did get offered to be on Paul Mitchell, my, um, I don't know how many people know this story. So we, do you know the story? And we talked about the fact that you've been offered to be on Paul Mitchell. We talked about it way back okay. in episode 12, which was probably seen by maybe 12 people, right? Uh, okay. But it, it's a compelling story because that was one thing that as a martial artist, who mm. everybody that watches this show knows has always bled black and white. That's all mm. I ever right uh for me i always wondered ross is so good like why not like why why aren't we getting him why isn't that happening or why is he saying no or whatever it is right so i think maybe the abbreviated version or whatever you're comfortable with um yeah. of that story i do think that's it's it's intriguing yeah the the abbreviated version and there's a reason why i'm bringing this up uh the abbreviated version of the story is after i left full circle um i was training with chris Rapold. And he wanted to have a conversation with me. So I go up personal best karate. I'm sitting in his office. He calls up Damon on the phone, puts him on speakerphone. Now, Chris in front of him has one of those big, like yellow sheets of paper with a pen uh, and he's ready to take notes. So they're like, listen, what can we offer you? We'd love to have you on the team, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. We we love what you do, whatever. Um, So I was like, let me get that pen and paper. And I'm sure they were asking more so on the side of like sponsorship money. How many events do I want to go to? What do I want? You know, whatever, you know, um, I wrote down two things. I wrote down Trevor Nash, Mike Pombero, and I slid it back to them. They couldn't make it happen. Mm. So it it broke, it broke my heart too, because, (laughs) and, and, and this is, um, I'm not trying to be disrespectful towards the fighters that were on the team at that moment, but it was Greg Betlack, Elias Lemon, Alex Lane. It's like, those guys were my competitors. Like, how can I, how can I, in the competition mindset that I have, that I've spoke about earlier, compete against these guys and want to, want to crush them and then be in the foxhole with them, be buddy, buddy, be like, all right, guys. And me like share information of this is how we're going to beat this guy. It, those just they weren't my guys, right? They they weren't my guys. But someone like Mike P, someone like Trevor Nash, guys that I can learn from, that I can grow with and get better with, that was like I would have betrayed Jotty Tension's wishes and said, because Jotty's like, you're not fighting for Paul Mitchell, you're not doing it. But I would have been like, you know what, man? If you could fight right now with Mike P and Trevor, you would do it too. So regardless of the uniform. And uh, I blame non-compliance. They, Paul Mitchell couldn't make it happen, so blame the upper management. Um, but I, I'll say that in, in joking. But um, Mikey P just had a baby. Trevor had had, had just bought United Martial Arts, um, so they were all in different phases of their life. But that's why uh, that's how much love I have for Mike P. Like that's the guy I wanted to fight next to. But in comparison to some of the other guys, I didn't get them to see him compete as much, and I don't think he won those like peak moments as much. Mm-hmm. Cool. I appreciate that because I'm somebody I maybe got to see him fight a couple of times at the very <laughs> end when I was first starting out. Mm-hmm. But because of that, I became a fan of him from that and sure. then went back and watched the tape. And then, you know, in the tape, you always see fights. You know what I mean? Unbelievable. Yeah. So, of course. And, and I appreciate you going through it and, and telling that story because that is like that conversation. And I, I've been in that same office that you were in mm-hmm. at personal best, probably. Um, like that conversation, that meeting is, I mean, in some ways it changes modern sport karate, whether or not that happens, you know what I mean? Um, 100%. That as a sport karate nerd and as a Paul Mitchell fan, 
Like just hearing that is, and I was, I was teammates with Alex Lane and Elias Lemon and Greg Betlock. Mm-hmm. My first year on the team was their, was their last. Obviously Alex came back and fought more after that, yeah. uh, but it was like the, the last of, of that core of fighters. I think that same year we picked up DeAndre Walker and he, he was kind of fighting for teams as kind of a flex mm-hmm. guy. Uh, but anyway, so like, again, I could talk about how crazy that is uh, all day long. I feel like that there was one more, uh, there was one more thought that, that gave me that I wanted to hit on. Where did it go? What was it? Okay, well, we'll see if I get back to it. So I'll go ahead and get to the last question because mm-hmm. I, I know that, that I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about this. You're doing a lot of great things for sport martial arts competitors in particular that are partaking in your program and kind of under your guidance. So I want to I want to give you that alley to talk about Turbo Sports Performance and uh, what you guys have been doing with that. Obviously, you're the founder of it. You've been doing great things with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, sell yourself a little bit, my man. Thank you, man. Well, I mean, I hope there's not much to sell. You know, I, I don't want to be the guy who's standing up here being like, you have to work with me, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't really want it to be like that. I, I just like to put my information out there. And if you decide to work with me, I, I'm, I'm happy to help you reach your goals. But it really started as, you know, I'm, I'm a physical therapist. I heard my doctor of physical therapy. And, um, you know, over the years, I started working with a lot of combat athletes uh, in my area locally in person. Um, and more recently, like when I was still working in person, uh, I worked for a company called Restore Physical Therapy, who I'm no longer with because I'm doing my own thing now. But I was treating, I'd say like 60% of my caseload were martial artists. And it's just like people in the region, just because I, I became connected in all the communities, kickboxing, boxing, Muay Thai, jujitsu, judo, wrestling, like people were seeking me out because they were, people were getting good results and they could relate to me, right? There's nothing worse than having an injury and going to someone who not only, first of all, doesn't even look like they're in shape, right? Some that, and that's a whole other conversation of like taking health advice from people who probably need health advice, right? So don't do that. But also like if, if there's a physical therapist and they've played baseball all their life, how are they possibly going to understand how to get you back to sport karate? It's not happening. Not at the level and not at the rate that you want it to happen at. So the martial artists near me were like, well, this guy trains, he competes, he knows what he's talking about. He does it like he's literally doing it with me. And um, so I think people just started to relate to that. And um, it became something where I'm like, you know what? If I could do this every day of my life, this is who I want to work with. I want to work with martial artists, not just in Rhode Island, all around the world. So, you know, we were able to develop this program that's remote. You know, there, there's options for in-person, but it's, you know, I'd say 90% remote. And uh, I now, thankfully, thanks to the community that, that trusts me with their health and their progression, it's gone from injury rehabilitation, which is where it started, to strength training for combat sports. And I consider sport karate is a combat sport um, to, you know, flexibility, mobility training for the recreational athlete who just wants to stay healthy. And for competition, you know, sports specific training for competition. So it kind of spans those four phases or those four pillars. Um, And I have the capacity to work with anyone all over the world. And I do. Um, So, you know, I'm really excited about what's coming for this year. Um, Yeah, it's it's really cool stuff. Watch my Instagram. You'll see all sorts of uh, good information. Just like I, I try and throw some comedy in there of like little little things. I'm getting better at my Instagram reels. Thanks to my wife. She's teaching me how to, you know, use reels and all that. So I'm getting better at putting my info out there. But um, if you guys have any questions, just shoot me a message and I'm happy to talk about it. And the most important thing, I think the one take home I can say, and the one thing that makes me different from everybody else, obviously the fact that I do it, I understand it. I know what you have to go through and how to be successful, but also every single program is customized. So you're never going to get the cookie cutter everyone's going to get the same program. It is not. I put a lot of time into it. Uh, uh, The same way I approach my training is the way I approach my business. I'm constantly working on how to create the the absolute best for everyone. Um, I've even brought on my personal strength and conditioning coach. So you know, it's good stuff when the guys in my program are getting what I get too, you know? So if you like what you see from me, the results speak for themselves. Um, Yeah, man, I'm super pumped. Uh, a lot of cool stuff and I'll let you say what you want to say and I'll, I'll give you a little hint on what's rolling around in my brain right now. <laughs> well, Hey, congratulations on getting that Thank going and all the success that you've had with it. And, uh, I mean, I'm not going to delay it anymore. Go ahead. What, what, what's, what's on your mind? 
Uh, nothing, nothing's happening yet. Um, but I, maybe I can use this platform. This is the first time I'm saying it out loud other than to my wife and a couple of people that, uh, that I really trust, but I am seriously considering running a turbo sports performance mini camp. Um, so I would love to do that. It would be competition driven, of course, and there would be training phases, but there would also be, you know, education, strength and conditioning, some nutritional stuff. So, you know, if you're looking to take your game to the next level, keep your eyes peeled because we might be doing a mini camp as soon as this year. So you never know. That's awesome. And thank you for announcing that here. So now everybody can come here and find out the scoop on what Ross is up to. Mm. Uh, but absolutely guys. I mean, I, I have, number one scene. I remember um, like years ago teaching seminars and tournaments. I think there was even one year where we were in Guatemala at the same time. Like mm -hmm. there's been a lot of overlap when, when I've gotten to see this guy teach and, and he is a master of what he does. And that's just in the sport karate world. Now you put on top of that, all the experience that he has full contact, being a doctor of physical therapy, all the expertise that this guy brings. It, it's, it's phenomenal. It's something that everybody that is in this space should take advantage of. Uh, so as soon as you finish watching this podcast you need to go to your dms you need to hit up ross and you go to turbo sports performance you. and you need to make it happen uh because it's worth it and it'll pay dividends for you i've got my last two thoughts which is the thing that i was thinking of before that i couldn't remember and also yeah. my dad actually texted in a question so i, I got let's go dad that. mr rudolph uh, okay so let's, the let's, let's talk about dad first let's talk about dad first yeah. Okay. So we'll go with, with dad first. Um, his question was, you mentioned that there were only three guys, I guess it's kind of a mean question, but there's only three guys that you never actually got the opportunity to beat. So he wants to know who they were. <laughs> Trevor Nash, Brian Ruth, Ninja Fitzpatrick. A lot of people don't know Ninja. As best. Well so I know a lot of people know the first two. Give us a little bit more about Ninja Fitzpatrick. Kind of an anomaly, man. Ninja ninja was the trevor killer um ninja beat trevor a lot I, yeah a lot uh ninja fought for cjb he's a jersey guy um came out of ninja university hence the nickname ninja uh ninja lamont fitzpatrick ninja um yeah man he was he was one of those guys who was like always in the mix he didn't really win a lot of overalls but he was talented. He was fast for a bigger guy. He hit really hard. He was sneaky. Played the game really well. Like he was an annoying dude to fight. He frustrated the heck out of Trevor. Um, and I never got a chance to. I only fought him twice. Same thing with Trevor. Same thing with Brian Ruth. Um, Brian, I've tied in team fighting, so I don't really count that. It was zero zero going to the match, but we tied. Um, you know, so, but I never beat him and I lost to him for a diamond, diamond national super fight. Uh, Trevor Nash, I fought twice, one when I was like 15 at super grands and he was smoking everyone. <laughs> yeah. I was young. People don't know. I wasn't of age. Um, they, they let me in the team division. Um, and then I competed as an adult, but, uh, yeah, Trevor beat me at super grands when I was like 15, 16. And then, um, he beat me at new England open and we never crossed paths again. And then Ninja, I fought twice. I fought him once at the Capital Classics and lost in overtime. And then I lost once at a, a random tournament in Maryland in overtime. So, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, as yeah. soon as you said Lamont Fitzpatrick, I was like, that rings a bell. It was, it was yeah, the yeah. thing that for whatever reason. Go, go back and watch. I mean, he had some wild fights with Trevor. Him and Trevor used to go at it, man. Crazy oh, fights. I'm going to have to do some film study on that. And then the reason that I couldn't think of what I was thinking of earlier was I was trying to remember a question. It wasn't a question. It was actually a response to one of the things you said that I think pulls back the curtain a little bit because I related so well to this. When you were talking about the, the Paul Mitchell situation and, you know, being teammates with like just Alex and Greg, and like they were your, they were your rivals. They were your competitors. They were the people mm -hmm. that you tried to beat. That is something, and I guess I'm addressing anybody watching right now that eventually wants to be on Paul Mitchell like I did when I was a kid. It is something inherent about the culture of Paul Mitchell that everyone who agrees to wear black and white agrees that the best interest of only the team comes, comes above all else. And I didn't learn that until I'd already been on the team for several years. And it was hard for me to do that because a lot of people don't know this. I've said it on the show before, but it surprises people when I say it because I guess people think I'm a nice guy or whatever. And, and it's different for forms and weapons than it was for point fighting. Sure. Because we don't have to hit each other. Mm -hmm. But I was an angry competitor. When I ran a bow form, 
I, I was the, the thoughts in my mind or how much I wanted to beat whoever it was. Like, I don't care if you're on my level, if you're not on my level, if you step in the ring with me, my mentality was to dominate. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I often would, would make myself angry before I go on stage and do something. Right? That's an important, that's an important word too. Cause, cause you didn't say, I want to beat this guy. You didn't say I want to win. You didn't say I want to be better that day. No, you said dominate. You want to put everyone, there has to be a gap, right? And that gap is so important. That gap is so important. So yeah, for, for competitors out there who were like high five and the guys you're competing against stop. <laughs> I don't care if your teammates, I've said stop. that so many times, bro. Stop shaking hands. Stop shaking hands, stop hugging, cut it out, dominate, get out there and dominate. You're a competitor. This is not, don't go for the trophy. Don't go for the money. Go because you want to be the best person in the room by far. Mm. That's how you get successful and do it over and over. Right. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. It's a great way to end the show. And to tie it back into what I was saying about the team is that that's mm -hmm. something. And, and by the way, it wasn't just me. I had competitors who felt that way as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Reed Presley, Cole Presley and I, we are the best of friends, especially like once competition's over and everything. Mm -hmm. But we had an agreement amongst the three of us. Well, they were brothers, so not between the two of them. <laughs> but there was this unspoken agreement between the three of us that like, hey, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to hate each other. And then we're going to get over it, right? Yeah. But in, in a way, we needed that to really go out there and, and try to mm -hmm. dominate the other competitors, right? And that is the point that I'm making about Paul Mitchell is that you've got to be able to flip that switch. Is yeah. that if you're going to, to wear that uniform, just know your best competitors are going to be recruited. That is part of the, the mm -hmm. model. Paul Mitchell doesn't want the one that wins all the time only. They want that one. And the one that wins when there's an upset, and then the other one that wins when they mm -hmm. both drop. They want every single person. It's the monopoly, right? They want them that's monopolizing. Yeah. But there still has to be one, right? Mm -hmm. And although, yes, if technically, if you have everyone on stage wearing the same uniform, yay, the team wins, but there's got to be that person. Because no one is like, Paul Mitchell won. They're like, Jackson Rudolph won. It's a difference. But there's a different Jackson ring to Rudolph, there's a different Jackson ring to Rudolph that. We'll still tell you that Paul Mitchell won. By the way. Anyway, I love that's the perspective. You're a I love. <laughs> I love, but one, that's one thing that's so great about this particular episode, and, and why I love having you on is because there is there's so much about us that I feel is alike in our mentality. We're both mm -hmm. bow guys. Like you punch more people in the face than I do, <clears> but <throat> like there, there's so much that we do have in common as far as mentality. But then that one key difference of the guy who was only ever Paul Mitchell and the guy who was, although absolutely qualified enough, as you can tell from this Thank conversation, you. the guy that was never Paul Mitchell, right? Mm -hmm. So it, the, 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 the dichotomy between us about that. The I hero and the anti-hero. Yeah, <laughs> you're anyway. the hero. I'm the anti-hero. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Ross, real talk, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Thanks show. I hope amazing. everybody tuned in. Had to have had a blast with this. No pun intended with the turbo rocket. I got to stop talking. Anyway, uh, but I just want to give you an opportunity. Any closing thoughts, comments, and uh, above all else, thank you from me to you. Uh, your time is so greatly appreciated. Thank you, man. And um, thank you for thinking of me in, in a situation like this with AK coming up. And um, I'm just very, I'm very grateful that I'm still relevant to the sport karate world. Um, I would love to be even more relevant with the people that I can help, you know, so um, if you are interested in, in even just asking a question on what I have to offer when it comes to turbo sports, I want to see people physically succeed, avoid injuries, stuff like that. Because if you guys can stay healthy, you can continue making sport karate shine. I'd love to help you do that on top of learning how to dominate, you know, both physically, mentally, you know, and, and competitively. So um, I appreciate you, man. I'm so proud of everything that you do. Seriously. Um, you know, I don't say that to a lot to a lot of people, um, but really like the, the way that you're going about it. If you look at it, we, we had this candidly off, off camera, off the record, but I, I'm confident in saying it here, very few people from our community go on and do like really big things and, and go and get those higher level educations and, and go and make a difference in the world. And you're one of them and you're leading the way with the rest of us. So super proud of you, man. Um, you did it in the ring, you're doing it out of the ring. And that's what this is all about, right? These values that we learn from competition, from training, from martial arts, how do we apply them elsewhere? Cause it, it can't just stop here. 
So I'm proud of you. Keep doing what you're doing. Anything I can do to help in the future, I'll do that. And uh, to everyone out there, good luck at AKAs. Hit me up if you need me, and you'll see me in the pit soon. Thank you so much, Ross. From the bottom of my heart, you, you got me. You got me emotional here at the end of the show. Thank you. Appreciate everybody. you. A lot. And uh, again, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you hit that share button if you enjoyed this episode. This has been episode 120 of the Jackson Rudolph podcast. I'm Jackson Rudolph, and I'll see you next time.